very much and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, I found out about this uh, slightly late, a bit like uh, Dr. Hakim and uh, I've, I've got my thoughts for a 10 minute slot. I, think, I thought it was 20 minutes so apologies for the whistle stop tour of um, the Grab Mapstone Oaks measurement. Um, I am a honorary senior lecturer at UCL, uh, but for the most part I'm a jobbing neuroradiologist. And uh, what I'd like to do is actually just talk a little bit about this particular metric. Um, I was slightly flummoxed by the whole thing because it's a slight paradox. Uh, you've gathered from the talks this morning that it's this highly complex uh, entity that we're dealing with. And uh, the paradox is that we've, we've reverted to a very, very simple measure uh, on imaging and I'll talk a little bit about it um, and, and what I'd like to go through is what it represents, how we measure it and in what populations we actually apply it um, and how reproducible and reliable is, is, the, is the measure. So if we actually go to, it's always nice to have a historical perspective, albeit quite recent, uh, this was the initial paper uh, published in 1999 and you can see there that the, the initial intent was to look at ventral brainstem compression in a very select group of patients with carry one malformation. Um, and these are young patients. And, and what they were faced with is this situation where you had uh, quite clear evidence of a carry one malformation, so of tonsillar herniation, um, because of the posterior fossa deformation. Uh, and you have different grades of deformation of the ventral spinal cord of the medullary, uh, cervical medullary junction. So what they've labelled here is sort of absent, mild, and sort of a, a more severe compression. And what they will set out to do then is to look at uh, a strategy uh, for an operative strategy uh, in terms of stratifying risk. Um, they recognised that X-rays were deficient in doing so because all you were doing what you were doing there is to look at the odontoid and the skull base and to look at the relationship of the osseous structures. And what they also recognized was that treatment could only be effective if you actually addressed the vector that was causing the maximal cervical medullary compression. So they attempted to use MRI uh, and a novel-based measure to then objectify the degree of odontoid impression on the ventral aspect of the foramen magnum and the rostral spinal canal. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the measure itself. Uh, quite elegant in its, in, in its, um, in its manner. Uh, what you do is you subtend the line from the tip of the basium to the posterior inferior aspect of C2, and then a perpendicular plumb line to the dorsal, uh, sort of the ventral dural aspect. Okay, so that's your cervical medullary junction, ventral spinal cord, and that's the, the measure. Okay, so what they did in the paper was to describe this on a midline sagittal MRI, and then arbitrarily, they, they, they grouped the measurements for this cohort of patients, pediatric patients with carry one malformations, and risk stratified them. Okay, so we have measures that have been arbitrarily um, developed six millimeters for a low risk, six to nine millimeters for a medium risk, and nine millimeters. And what they found, we'll, we'll talk about what they found a bit later on. And it was a, a fairly good range in terms of uh, measures. How, how reliable or reproducible are these measurements? Well, just, this is just a snapshot of the literature in terms of reproducibility uh, using the interclass correlation coefficient. And you can see here from the select papers and the numbers of patients that were looked at and the type of patients that were looked at that is quite diverse in terms of looking at this particular measure. Uh, it doesn't really matter because you know everyone's got, well, most of the population will have a clivus. Uh, a C2 um, uh, vertebra, and you can actually then look at the variability between uh, measurements for individuals and between individual uh, between the same person at different times. But what you'll see here is that there are different modalities that have been used to actually look at that measure. So we're, we're dealing with not just with MRI, but also some variation in terms of the measure. Now the measurement that's been described in an initial paper was very prescriptive. It, it is to the dural, to the ventral aspect of the dura, but you know there are some variations in terms of, to include, including the panis, obviously looking at the ventral aspect of the dura uh, on CT can be quite challenging. And um, if you're looking at so pediatric patients versus other clinical groups that can be slightly variable 
depending on the degree of pattern that actually is formed in the dorsal aspect of the dens. So, if we talk a little bit about the patients that this has been applied to, remember that the initial publication was primarily focused on pediatric and young adults, uh, patients with carry-on malformation. And through that process of that malformation, what you get is odontoid retroflexion, basaline vagination and platybasia, and that actually serves to cause a ventral impression on the foramen magnum, reducing the actual caliber of the, uh, of the outlet or, or, or that space. And it was, the initial paper was to look at an operative strategy in terms of risk stratification for ventral spinal cord compression. It's since been recognized that in KR1 malformation that this is quite, the grab oaks measurement is quite a sensitive uh, measure compared to other morphometrics in the cranial cervical junction. And that's been addressed primarily in the pediatric uh, population. And taking that further, it's also been used to risk stratify uh, patients who would benefit from not just decompression but also occipital cervical fusion surgery. So the combination of using the grab oaks measurement at a cutoff of more than nine millimeters, a cervical, um, a clival axial angle of less than 125 millimeter, uh, 25 degrees, and a carry 1.5 uh, entity, which means that the orbex is actually beyond the, or at the level of the foramen magnum. Once you risk stratify patients in that category, they would then be seen to be benefiting from occipital cervical fusion. But how does this relate to hypermobility syndromes, EDS, and hereditary uh, disorders of connective tissues? Well, the so-called seminal paper was published in 2007, where there was an association drawn with carry one malformation and, uh, hypermo uh, and connective tissue disorders, grouped together as an all-encompassing mesodermal disorder. What they did there was to look at 3D CT and X-ray morphometrics, and to utilize invasive traction methods um, in three particular subgroups of patients. So ones with Chiari-1 malformations, um, connective tissue disorders with Chiari-1 malformations, and healthy controls. Uh, note that there was no utilization of the grab oaks measurement in that particular paper, but it was quite useful. It was quite an important paper in that it drew that association of one and the other. And what they found in terms of the morphometrics that uh, in that subgroup of patients with connective tissue disorders and carrier malformation, that you had altered morphometrics from the rest of the population of carrier malformation patients and healthy controls. Uh, I'll talk, it's beyond the remit of this particular discussion to actually talk about those morphometrics until maybe later on in the discussions, but it was then proposed that there is a process in patients with uh, connective tissue disorders of cranial settling, uh, occipital cervical posterior uh, gliding, which means a translational movement, resulting in these decreased angles uh, at the, uh, the clavo axle angle, amongst other things, which then results in a progressive retroodontite panis formation. And that is the mechanism, the proposed mechanism for ventral uh, narrowing of the foramen magnum, resulting in a potential basal impression and therefore potentially as well ventral spinal cord herniation, uh, compression, sorry. Thereafter, based on largely that uh, evidence, um, uh, there is an, a body of evidence that's developed mostly on consensus, uh, which talked about a cervical medullary syndrome, which you know we've, we've had a little conversation about. It's a cluster of syndromes which has been attributable to potential ventral spinal cord compression and may be associated with cranial cervical instability. Now remember that the, the, the grab oaks measurement is not really a measure of instability as such, but on ventral spinal cord compression. So the two have been drawn together. And I think more recent publications have, have reflected that there, there, there is a need to actually look at a more dynamic approach, have a more dynamic approach to cranial cervical instability and to advocate the use of the grab oaks measurement in uh, ventral brainstem, uh, uh, spinal cord compression, brainstem compression, in hypermobile patients. And it's been recently shown in a follow-up study of 20 patients that post 
CCJ stabilization for craniosubacal instability, that the Grabox measurement does actually improve after. Um, so, so that's a, a form of a utility for the, uh, the Grabox measurement in terms of outcome measures, and that correlates quite well with, with uh, patients' uh, improvements in symptoms. So just going through the historical literature to, to present day, what we, we, we find is that uh, the evidence really for the use of the Grabox measure is really in Chiari-1 malformation. And in a select population of patients uh, who are predominantly in the pediatric age group and young adults, um, there was a little bit of discussion about uh, why patients would develop symptoms of later on. Uh, in terms of craniosophical instability, and I think more recent publications have actually dealt with morphometric changes in the craniosophical junction, and that could contribute to that, that, that change, that threshold change, with, and, and clinical presentation uh, towards adulthood. Uh, just looking at the literature, there is, in terms of the application of the grab oaks measure, there is some heterogeneity in terms of which imaging modalities are used. The original description was purely of midline sagittal T1 and T2 weighted images, but we've looked at the reproducibility studies utilizing uh, CT, MRI, and in different populations. So you know we need to be slightly cautious about how we apply it and then which modalities. And of course, most of the evidence is actually based on, uh, in terms of the association with connective tissue disorders, uh, based on a single non-epidemiological study in 2007. So I think there's room there to actually explore that further. And some work that's been done uh, subsequent to that um, showed that in terms of morphometrics and the craniosophical junction, there weren't any single morphometrics that correlated with patients with Chiari-1 malformation and um, a connective tissue disorder that was published in 2018. It's always worthwhile actually bearing in mind what's been expressed um, before uh, in the previous talks that you know EDS in itself is quite heterogeneous as a, as a population, there are 13 different types at least, and the ge genetics can be quite variable. Uh, so when actually applying those measures to a cohort of patients which are quite heterogeneous, then you are expected to get some varying results anyway. And that calls into question some of the clinical criteria that's used to actually then make a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS. So are we in a situation where we've moved from this uh, particular measurement for this particular entity in young patients where you've got a grab oaks threshold of nine millimeters there to this particular situation where clearly you have got no impression on the ventral uh, cervical medullary junction or upper spinal cord, but still having a threshold of nine millimeters and, and labeling them in the same, putting them in the same basket. So we've got to be slightly cautious. So moving forward, really, I think the opportunities really are in terms of developing research to address these issues. So you know, what does that, what does that measure mean in EDS patients versus controls? What does that look like in terms of dynamic upright imaging versus static MRI, or even looking at CT morphometrics? Um, how does that compare with EDS patients with carry one versus just EDS patients without carry one malformations? And you can extend that to you know, those with a clear uh, ventral brainstem compressive syndrome and those without. Uh, you can look at how the interaction of the grab oaks measurement with other morphometrics at the craniosophical junction uh, interact, especially in the context of craniosophical instability, and that's a different definition, different morphometrics that are involved there. And how does that correlate with clinical outcomes and scores? So that, that, that's... Uh, that's really you know, room to actually manoeuvre in terms of research, and I think that's where the, the real thrust should be. And at the end of this whole process, if we've been through this process, do we need to actually refine the measurement? Or, or in the worst case scenario, do we need to then discard it and say, well, actually, it's not fit for purpose in this particular category of patients. It's useful in carry one malformation patients in the pediatric age group. Do we need to actually think about something else? So it it's clearly is quite easily applicable and reproducible, but the evidence supports its use for stratifying risk of ventral brainstem compression in carry one malformation patients in the younger age group. And uh, at present, there is limited evidence for its utility in EDS and craniosophical instability. And I think that's where the opportunities for further research and, and to determine its true utility comes.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much.